Howdy kids, welcome to uh, another session of sitting with Dr. Lobese. All right, now I know that uh, most of the year and most of these videos, uh, if I did any kind of uh, musical interlude, it was a rap, and I thought, well, Y'all might get be getting tired of that, so I I thought what I would do is uh, mix things up a little bit and maybe try my hand at singing a little ballad. So y'all have to tell me what you think. All right, here we go. I have a lot to say, but I don't know where to start. I may not be the best. But I've got lots of heart. Lobezy sings and raps to his FHC fans. Hoping you'll watch this video's the plan. It's hard to believe, but the end will soon be here. I have memories inside. To keep you all near. We've met a French cardinal who goes by Ricky Lee, a German monk named Martin, and the indulgences fees. But now is the time for a tale of Madame Deficit. It's curtains for Louis. And Marie Antoinette, is it the great fear or some other illusion? No, it's those crazy French and their revolution. Hmm, what y'all think? You think I ought to stick with this? Country ballads, or should I go back to the raps? Hmm, I don't know. Guess you all gonna have to help me figure that out. All right, so anyway, on the docket today is the French Revolution. We're gonna get about halfway through because it's getting late and I gotta get to sleep. All right, well... We've already done talked about uh, revolutions, and I think in one of our lessons we talked about how in these uh, situations there's like a pattern with revolutions, and when we were discussing the American Revolution, or is it the uh, War of Independence? Well, they got a moderate phase, a radical phase, and then there at the end they got this uh, backlash, all right? Now, we kind of learned that in the American Revolution, that just wasn't the case. But during this uh, topic, you're going to see a moderate phase, a radical phase, and then uh, a backlash where they, the people who is uh, doing all the killing and whatnot, kind of get tired and are looking to reestablish a status quo. So, uh in here in the notes, it talks a little bit about some of those uh, some of those things and you know particular uh, causes that uh, brought this uh, very uh, important uh, seminal phase of uh, European history. Okay, French Revolution. There's uh, a lot of uh, underlying causes, but what what we must remember what's what's key here boys and girls, is that life don't change. I mean, life don't uh, return back to normal, all right? This this here is a turning point in history in Europe, and uh, they're going to try, the people that are in control, they're going to try to keep the lid on, um, but uh, this is like trying to put a genie back into his bottle, and it's just not going to be possible. They're going to try, but... Uh, the forces uh, to be the the bubbling and the gurgling uh, that we've done talked about in the past, uh, they just not gonna be able to tamp that back down. All right, so uh, 
what we need to talk about are uh, some of them uh, causes. And I think we should start right there where it talks about the old regime. All right. The old regime or regime, as it were. Uh, see, what they had in France going all the way back to the Middle Ages was this uh, uh, stratified society. All right. And uh, you had it was basically a situation where you had a, uh, two privileged classes and then everybody else, the vast majority. And um, uh, these groups uh, were at odds with one another because, uh, you know, uh, uh, reform, as we've said before, uh, either comes from above or most assuredly will come from below. And that's what we're going to see here. Um, but the uh, the old regime um, was a system left over from the Middle Ages where uh, the various classes uh, were too stratified and there was, you know, uh, essentially the haves and the have-nots. Uh, but what's important for us to know is who these people are or what these three groups um, are. And uh, the first two estates or the first two groups, they're, they're essentially the same, okay, because they're the privileged class. But the first uh, estate, more specifically, uh, was the uh, the clergy that existed in France. And France, we all know, uh, was a Catholic nation. Um, and all the clergy consisted uh, of about 100 uh, to about 130,000 people. And among that group, uh, mo th th there was actually a divide. We, we don't often ref talk about this, but there was a divide within the first estate, meaning... Um, you had at the bottom, you had the, the priests and the, and the monks that lived out there making beer in the monasteries. Well, no, it's in France, so they was probably making cheese and wine and some uh, chag, uh, champagne, all right? But uh, at the top, they had the, the, the ecclesiastical positions, you know, like the bishops and the cardinals. Uh, those were typically uh, the nobles, okay? And going all the way back um, to, uh, let's see, about the 15th century, uh, there was a situation between Rome and the French uh, 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 monarch where uh, they could pay a specific amount of money to uh, appoint, uh, the king could appoint the people that he wanted to be uh, the head of the church, all right? Uh, in the second estate, uh, this was the nobility, okay? And just like in the first estate, there were two groups, but both of these groups would be considered uh, the privileged class because they're they're all nobles, all right? And uh, this is a little bit larger, three to 400,000, um, and, and, and they were great and large landowners, all right? The difference is, lie in the type of nobles and the first type of noble were the nobility of the robe. Now these were nobles that had hadn't always had those positions. Uh, they were granted these positions uh, either because they were uh, supporters of um, the monarchy or they had uh, purchased these positions as a way to uh, gain status in society but also to gain tax exemption. And see, that was one of the things that was um, very important for you to understand about these privileged uh, classes is that they didn't have to pay taxes like everybody else. Uh, it would it would be almost vulgar uh, to to be seen as a uh, uh, somebody who paid taxes. Uh, but the second and okay, so you had the nobility of the robe and. Um, then you had the nobility of the sword, and these are the more traditional nobles. These are the nobles that had gained, they had always uh, possessed land, and so um, they were always the nobles. So the, the, they are the older of the two, okay, the nobility of the sword. Um, but uh, they didn't pay no taxes, okay, and so we're going to get to that in just a moment, but um, 
Ooh, look here. We got a nice little chart. I like these charts, man. They got all kinds of information. If you look at them and spend some time, but uh, what you're going to see is, man, this doggone thing, there's three estates, but it is so uh, lopsided as far as size goes because the third estate, uh, they made up about 97% of the population. And and this these were the tax-paying um part of segment of the population and they were not considered privileged okay because uh, they did pay the taxes all right and so what we need to do is divide these guys up into three groups the first that was the largest they were the peasants okay because france hadn't gone to uh, uh its industrial revolution yet so they are still an agrarian economy okay so that means they making their uh, living from the land um and these are all the peasants and farmers, about 80% of the population, okay? And they they, they paid heavy taxes, uh, not only uh, to the state, uh, in what the, the primary tax was something called the taya, all right? And that was a land, or that was a, a tax on land, okay? And uh, not only that, but they had feudal obligations uh, that they either had to work the land of their noble uh, landowner or they had to pay some kind of fee. And not only that, they had to pay uh, tithing to the church, uh, typically about 10%. And then they also had to uh, pay for hunting rights, fishing rights. Heck, they had to pay right to have their wheat ground into uh, uh, flour for them to eat bread. Because the French, that's pretty much all they ate, especially the peasant class is they all ate bread, about two pounds of bread a day, okay? And then uh, they also had to pay uh, a fee just to bake their bread, all right? Uh, and that was all provided by the nobility, okay? So these were people who weren't very well off to begin with, and on top of that, they getting hit doubly hard with all these taxes and fees, all right? The next group, uh, that we need to talk about are the city workers, okay? And these are people who lived in um, many of the uh, larger cities in in uh, inside of France. And although France had a very uh, large population, probably somewhere around 25 million, uh, they didn't really have too many cities, but Paris certainly was uh, the largest of them. And these people were primarily uh, poor, okay? Some of them were shop owners. Uh, many of them, or some of them were uh, artisans. Uh, some were, uh, I guess, many of them, especially the females, were servants. All right. Uh, and these people uh, were specific or were, were particularly dependent upon um, bread. And so anytime. That there, and this is important. Anytime there was a, a shortage of bread, that would cause the prices to spike. And if you look at the revolution, and when things start like getting more and more violent, uh, what's funny, well, not funny, ha ha, but kind of interesting is the fact that uh, it was those times that the bread prices were the most um, expensive, okay? So there is a, a relationship between, a correlation, if you will, between uh, the, vi the violence of the revolution and those uh, bread prices, okay? And, and these uh, city workers are the ones who do most of the killing, and uh, these are the angry mobs, okay? Um, and what we have here is, oh, you can't see it because my face is kind of blocking it out, is this fella here called a San Kaloops. We'll talk about them. Uh, these are the, the people who didn't wear breeches. Now, if you wore breeches, uh, you, if you were a gentleman or a noble, you wore those uh, half pants, uh, you know, where they go to about knee length, and then you had socks, long socks. Well, these people didn't want to be um, have anything to do with the nobility, so they wore long pants, okay? And then here is a pretty famous uh, painting by this uh, painter here named Jacques-Louis David. All right. And this is an important painting because it's very realistic. And if 
if you could see in a, a, a close up of, uh, oops, uh, what I do right back here. This woman is, is uh, you can see by the lines in her face how hard her life has been, okay? And I think that that is what he was going for in this uh, portrait here. And she is a, you know, an anonymous woman, but it is designed to show uh, some of the adverse conditions that these uh, city workers had to uh, live under. All right. And then the third were the bourgeoisie or the burgoises. Um, and these were uh, the wealthy class. OK, uh, now, I didn't say nobility. Uh, but many of these people were, uh, it, you know, even though there wasn't very much uh, industrialization, they were uh, some of the larger business owners, um, uh, merchants. Some of them were involved in overseas uh, trade. Many of them were involved in uh, finance or banking. Uh, heck, some of them were just very skilled artisans. OK, so today in our society, the bourgeoisie would be the middle class. Okay, and when I say middle class, I don't necessarily mean uh, what it means today in the modern world. Modern world today, middle class means middle income, and that's not necessarily the case, although some were. In fact, some of the Borgoises were quite wealthy, but they were not nobility, all right? So they were not considered upper class. They were middle, all right? And these people were the most heavily taxed. However, they were, because many were doctors and lawyers were professionals, they were well-educated. And because of the uh, enlightenment, which was centered mostly in France, many of them were well-educated on enlightenment ideals. All right? And so they were very interested in getting uh, some reforms that would allow them to have more of a say in government. And in fact, they didn't want to be taxed so much. So they were hope, hoping for some changes, all right? So one of the other causes that we must be mindful of is the fact that those very enlightenment ideals inspired many of these people. And the two, well, there was three slogans uh, that we can attribute to the French Revolution. And they were liberté, equality, or egalité, and fraternity, which means more like brotherhood. We'll talk about that later. Specifically, liberty and equality. And what do those two words mean? First off, liberty means freedom from oppression. Uh, it means you have human rights, okay? And uh, we've talked about uh, with John Locke and uh, even the Declaration of Independence authored by uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, certain natural rights, life, liberty, and property. Uh, and, and you have within you um, the rights to each one of those and not to have them arbitrarily taken away by the state, okay? And so out of this word liberty comes a group of people known as liberals. Now that don't mean the same thing that liberals means today. Okay, although they might advocate for change, that would be one of the few similarities. Uh, liberals actually wanted, uh, they were very distrustful of government and uh, the possibility for tyranny. Uh, so many of the liberals were actually in favor of small, limited government. Okay, but um, that's what the word liberty means. Okay, when we get to... Uh, the idea of equality, uh, obviously being uh, seen as equals before the law, that uh, just because you come from the privileged class, that don't mean your life is any more valuable than anybody else's. And that was something that these people wanted recognized, that th their life had as much value as anybody else's, all right? And they wanted recognition uh, and they wanted that equality to be codified in the law of the land, okay, all throughout France, and that just wasn't the case, okay? So one thing that we need to understand, though, that as far as this equality goes, it don't go to all people, okay? 
Well, it don't go to women, all right? We're not there yet. Even though this revolution does get pretty radical, uh, they don't, they pretty much uh, ignore women. I mean, they get some rights, but for the most part, women uh, are going to miss the butt. They're going to miss the boat on this one, all right? Their changes aren't going to come until the 19th, 19th century, all right? Um, now, what what the equality meant was the right to vote and the right to hold office, okay? So that uh, you can, you know, have your ideas and your, you know, the, the reforms that you want put into place can, you know, have an opportunity um, to see the light of day. But as I said, equality was not necessarily extended to all in, in the, the voting rights and the, and the ability to run for office would not apply equally to all men. It would be just to those that were uh, landowners. And they actually had uh, in the beginning of the revolution, uh, specifications on like how much land you had to be a large landowner. Okay. So even though this revolution is seen as this big change, you know, this big moment in history, um, where, where lots of change takes place, it, it really doesn't, all right? Not by our standards, but for the time, for the time period, yes, uh, very great change, but uh, the way we would see it through our lens in the modern times it would be a uh, pretty insignificant change, but that's just the deal. All right. Uh, let's see what else. Um, I guess one other area that we need to talk about is, uh, is, is equality as far as economics are concerned. Okay. Because today we talk a lot about income inequality. Um, I believe there was a, a man that ran for, uh, office, here in the 2016 election named Bernie Sanders. And one of the things Bernie Sanders talked a whole heck of a lot about was income inequality and how that we as Americans have, you know, have rights and that the government has a right to make sure that everybody gets equal health care and that everybody gets uh, equal, uh, well, at least a certain, um, you know, threshold can be achieved as far as their uh, income and that's what people should come to expect. Well, that's not exactly what uh, the, the, the French, uh, uh, those that were in charge of the revolution wanted. They, they didn't necessarily mean uh, equality of uh, outcome. All right. That, that they just wanted to have opportunity. OK. And that is something um, that, that we must understand that distinction. OK. Um, so. Oh, right here, this term franchise. Make sure you know what that means, franchise. It don't mean like you're going to have a, uh, well, today, you know, you buy a franchise means you're going to go down there and buy you a, a, a Chuck E. Cheese or a, a, some kind of a fast food joint. That don't mean that. Franchise means to vote, okay? So the franchise was limited to men who were uh, large property owners. All right. So, as I've said in the past, and in case you need a refresher, uh, economics drives many of the events that take place in human history, okay? And so, uh, the country had gotten itself into economic uh, straits, and they had uh, enormous debt. And so, if we go back to the, the reign of Louis XIV, who, who lived very extravagantly with uh, the palace of Versailles, which he used to uh, uh, weaken the uh, the nobles. Uh, but he also fought uh, the war of Spanish succession and he uh, attempted to uh, take control over the Netherlands. Uh, so he left his country with a tremendous amount of debt. But then it under Louis the 15th, uh, there were two other wars that were fought and that was the War of Austrian Secession, and then the Seven Years' War. And both of those wars left uh, the countries that fought them uh, in debt, specifically Great Britain and also France, okay? And you may recall that after the Seven Years' War, the British, uh, because they fought at least half of the war in, uh, in America and fought 
uh, on behalf of the colonists, they wanted to recoup some of those uh, those losses. And so that's when they began te- taxing uh, the colonists, which created the, uh, you know, all of the, uh, uh, that was the impetus, if you will, for uh, the Americans uh, to, to fight for their independence. But um, with the French, what they decided to do in, in an attempt to kind of recoup their losses, well, I should say they went further into debt because that third war that they had, well, they had fought a series of wars against the British, okay? And the last serious war was the Seven Years' War, and that is the war that they kind of lose dominance. There is this competition between them and Great Britain, and Great Britain comes out on top, and so they're going to be the dominant European power. So as a way to get revenge, they support the Americans in their uh, efforts, okay, in the Revolutionary War, and so that um, further compiled their debt. So if we look at it, the 50% of their budget, all right, so that means half of all the income that they receive goes just to service the interest on the debt. All right. And that's terrible. That's tremendous. Even, even the United States today, we don't have that kind of a situation. Oh gosh. I bet we got uh, probably 250, 300 billion dollars a year go to service our debt. But, uh, our GDP is much, much higher. So it's, it's nothing, uh, that close, but, um, Something to take into consideration is when we used to, when we studied the Versailles under Louis the Fourteenth, it was closer to like 50, 50 uh, percent went to pay for uh, Versailles. It, you can see how how much it has shrunk six percent by the time of Louis the Sixteenth comes around. All right, uh, let's see what else. Um, so the problem does seem to be debt. All right. But to put things into perspective, uh, they didn't have quite as much debt as Great Britain had. And not only that, Great Britain had a country that was, uh, its population was half that of France. Uh, but it was so crippling to France because they, the way it was set up was all the people who had money, well, expect, I mean, the nobles, they were all tax exempt. So the situation was such that the, the, the king did not possess enough sovereignty over the nobility in order to force them to pay, okay? And not only that, uh, they had a court system known as the parliaments, okay? This is not a legislative body. This is a, uh, a judicial body. And what their, what their uh, I guess, one of the powers or one of the privileges, if you will, that they had was that any time the king would issue like an executive order, but they call them like edicts, uh, the, the the parliaments would have to register those edicts or decrees in order for them to be uh, legitimate. And oftentimes they refused because who were the judges? Well, they were nobles. Okay. And so this was a problem that Louis the 15th and Louis the 16th had to to deal with. And so what they're trying to do is through their finance ministers, and this is the whole uh, linchpin part of the uh, economic problem, is that their finance ministers are trying to find ways to issue taxes so that the nobles will pay their at least something, okay, to, to alleviate some of that debt. But the problem is that the nobles, they don't want to because culturally, they never had to do it. And so even though it may be in the best interest of their country, to them, it's an insult. And the only way that they would do it is if they had the power of the purse, like they do over in England, right? With par- the parliament over in England has got the power of the purse, the House of Commons. They pay taxes, but but they but they got to uh, have a say as far as what expenditures would be, okay? And in France, they didn't, okay? And so this is what the whole issue is, okay? Now, this here right here is talking about how uh, the reputation of the, uh, of the monarch was uh, soiled, if you will, uh, because Louis XV, and most kings had mistresses, but he happened to have a mistress that, A, 
came from uh, low birth. What I mean is she was not in the upper stratus of the nobility. And not only that, she had tremendous influence. And so for a woman to have influence on the king and his decisions, boy, that was just uh, ammunition for all the people to uh, gossip and write about and poke fun and, you know, with satire and things like that. And so the what we see over time is the reputation of the monarchy being uh, uh, slowly um destroyed and the same happens with louis the 16th and a lot of it has to do with his wife who was uh foreign and even though they didn't live quite as lavishly as uh did louis the 14th um the the perception was that they did all right and not only that they were out of touch okay and so the quote that uh uh, Marie Antoinette supposedly said was let them eat cake but she never really said that at least that's what the historians say but what that's supposed to mean is she was you know uh, approached or uh, or at least Versailles the gates of Versailles were approached by people who said they were starving and her response when you know when her handlers or whomever came to tell, to tell her that the people were begging that they didn't have enough bread to eat. She said, well, well, let them eat cake. Well, that that's to symbolize, again, just how out of touch she was. All right. Uh, let's see here. Um, yeah. So, you know, we, we've learned uh, with some of the uh, absolute despots that they uh, that they were pretty strong uh, rulers and especially when we talk about uh, Freddie, uh, Frederick the Great, how uh, he w he considered himself to be a first servant of the state. He didn't live very lavishly. Neither did uh, Maria Theresa uh, and, and neither did Catherine for that matter. But Louis and his wife, no, they did. All right. And uh, that kind of took them away uh, from uh, truly understanding the suffering of their people. OK, so the issue comes is when. There, there are proposals for taxes, all sorts of taxes, all these different attempts to try to get the nobility to pay their fair share. And every time they keep saying no, and the only way that they'll do it is in is if uh, they call into session what's known as the Estates General. Now, that's their legislative body, which hadn't been called into session for over like 175 years since like 1614. All right. But in order for the nobles to approve of any kind of taxation, they said, we're going to have to call in a session. All right. This estates general. And so this is kind of where we find ourselves at the beginning of the French Revolution, 1789, when uh, the money is run dry. The uh, those that are lending money to the to the monarchy have stopped. They said no more money. All right. And. And, and the ability for the, the king or the government to pay, they've, they've, they've reached a, an impasse, all right? And so this is where uh, things begin to take place and snowball, if you will, all right? So the decision had to be made how, when the estates general uh, is called in the session, so the first, the second, and the third estate will all be present, how are they going to vote? Well, the king granted double the number of deputies or, you know, um, members to the third estate. Double, just basically take what the first and second estate had combined was what the uh, third estate would get. And so they were hopeful that the votes would be counted that way by head by each individual deputy or representative there but what the uh, parliament of paris that court system stated was that the that the decision was going to be made or the votes were going to be cast by uh by order all right so that means each one of the three estates would receive only one vote and the problem with that is you got the two privileged classes the first and the second estate each having a vote and it's likely that they're going to vote together because 
they have the same uh, uh, sorts of privileges and um, it's they identify better with each other okay that is not to say that there were not some enlightened members of the clergy especially the priests um, and also among the nobility there were some that believed in liberal reforms okay not not as many as uh, the third estate would want but at least there would be some common ground but that was not to be the case because of the voting by head all right now when that decision was made um all bets were off but before before we get to that even before the estates general was called into a session i mean the decision was made in 1788 that they would meet the following uh i believe it was june all right so in that run up to the uh, the the actual meetings that would take place in june of 1789 the third estate began registering or recording their grievances okay and a lot of it had to do with taxation and a lot of it had to do uh, the other part had to do with representation being able to have their voices heard okay whether it be uh, in some kind of a constitutional monarchy or uh, being able to uh, just have more of a say okay uh, and so that's what this here is and i can't even pronounce it so i'm not even going to try all right but that is the uh, important little tidbit there that that was and, and you can see that they are well educated because many of, as I said, many members of the third estate were, were uh, lawyers. And so they were fit, familiar with the legalese of how to draft a document like that. And so it was uh, very much uh, professional sounding. This here fellow is uh, Emmanuel Joseph Saez or the Abbey Saez. He was somebody who was in charge of a, of a monastery and he considered himself one of the people, all right? And he gave a, well, he wrote a pamphlet and ended it, it, it's titled, What is the Third Estate? And basically up until this point, they'd been nothing. And uh, what what are they though? Well, the Third Estate is really everything, is what he's trying to say. That the members of the Third Estate, that's the whole population. They've got sovereignty, not the king and not the nobility. Heck, the nobility is really nothing. They don't do much of anything. In fact, they're just kind of like a um, some kind of insect that's feeding off of the people. All right. So he he's kind of putting his his uh, support behind the third estate. Okay. And and he says, what is what is it that the third estate wants? They want to be something. All right. They want to be somebody. They want to be a contender. All right. So the, so what happens is when the when the uh, parliaments make that decision on how the votes are going to be uh, counted, the third estate refuses to do any business. They say we no, all right. And so they they decided to break away and call in a new session or a new uh, body known as the National Assembly. And they heck they offered it to the. You know, they invited members of the first and second estate who might want to come with them, and some did, and they began holding meetings. Now, the king has an opportunity here to put the carbosh on this whole, uh, you know, uh, insubordination, if you will, but he, he sees the kind of the writing on the wall, and 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 he's afraid that if he does, uh, what what will that bring about, you know? Will, the, will will that trigger a, a rebellion all right and so he's he's trying to carefully avoid that and here's the thing about Louis the 16 he's not a strong leader he's not a man of strong conviction all right he's not a Frederick heck he's not a Catherine all right what would she have done all right well she would have put it down all right well ostensibly she would have that's just conjecture but he he truly weak uh he truly lacked the uh you know the, the courage and the conviction that being a head of state uh requires all right and so he he you know he dawdles back and forth and he vacillates on what to do and um 
he he is uh, uh, talked into by members of the first and second estate to 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 lock those uh, uh, to lock the people out of the national assembly that that third estate, and so that's what he does, thinking that that's going to deter them and send them back from Versailles to go back home. But they 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 continue on and they find a, a place to meet nearby and it was a, te- uh, a tennis court and they went into this tennis court and they made this famous oath called the tennis court oath and in it they said that they are going to continue the national assembly will continue in session until they have a new constitution drafted and the goal for that constitution at the time was to create a constitutional monarchy see moderate okay and that Going back, when they formed the National Assembly, some historians see that as the beginning of the French Revolution, where they parted ways and and went their went their own, they went their own way. Okay, uh, but it's still very modern. All right, not calling for the overthrow of the king, not calling for a republic or anything like that. It's going to be a while before that happens. So there is a decision. Two things, kind of two events are happening and they kind of collide, okay? So the king is concerned that this could get out of hands. So he orders up um, the troops or the, you know, the the army, okay? And he he stations 18,000 troops in parts of uh, Paris and in the roads leading from Paris out to Versailles. It's what, about 10, uh, 10, 12 miles between the two and to protect those roads. But it, um, some historians think that he was ultimately going to use uh, those troops to go to Versailles and perhaps arrest or compel uh, the members of the National Assembly to stand down, okay? So the other event that's important and noteworthy is that uh, the, the suffering that the people were going through. So in uh, 1788, the harvests the harvests were poor and the kind of reserves that the monarchy would normally have to ease the suffering of the people, they did not have. And so the conditions in the cities were such that the people needed relief, okay? And they were angry. And remember what I talked about those bread prices, okay? So they're getting all worked up into a lather and then they see the presence of these troops and they don't know what to think. They think that maybe, I mean, heck, you when you're hungry, Sometimes you you think crazy thoughts because all you're worried about is getting food in your belly and heck, somebody tell you something crazy, you're not in your right mind. So, you know, you might believe them, all right? And so that was the kind of situation uh, that we find, they find themselves in. And so when they see all these uh, troops assembling, they think that maybe the troops are going to kill everybody in Paris. And so they want to they wanna, um, arm themselves. And this is where... These people known as the sand colutes, all right? These are the crazies. And they're the ones that are going to do all the killing and, and whatnot during the uh, revolution. So they go and they start looking for weapons, all right? And ammunition and whatnot in case this, you know, comes to pass. So they go to this prison known as the Bastille, all right? And it's July 14th, all right? And so they, they want to get at what's inside the Bastille and they got weapons and they got uh, ammunition. So that's what they're after. Well, the uh, the warden or the governor of this uh, prison, um, he ain't gonna let them in. And he said, no. And so the people get angry and they, they find themselves some cannons because they start scouring all throughout the city and they start going to these weapons depots and they, you know, confiscating all these weapons and they bring these cannons and they start shooting the cannons at the, at the castle walls. And before you know, they breach the castle, but there's something important. This, this castle, but still is a prison. It's a political prison. And, uh, it's one in which people, it, it, it symbolizes all the things that are wrong with the old regime. All right. And how, you know, if you speak out against the monarch, you can get thrown in the dungeon and you get tortured and nobody ever hear from you again. And so, uh, when, when, when the governor of this uh, castle or this uh, prison wouldn't let them in, the people get angry, all right? And when they bust through that sucker, they round up the governor and uh, the mayor of the city of Paris, 
And you know what they do? They chop, they hack those two men fellers to death and they chop their heads off. They chop their heads off and they stick them on the end of pikes. You know what a pike is? A pike is a long spear that they you use during wartime against cavalry charges. So it's a long spear, like 10, 12 feet long. And you could stab a, a, a horse before the, uh, the cavalry rider has a, a chance to hack you to pieces with his sword. So they got that two heads and they parading them around. Crazy. All right, and this is when things start to go a little crazy. So this is another date, okay, historians look to, because after all, revolution means it's bloody, right? And so this is the first bloodshed, July 14, 1789. Uh, the French is known it as uh, Bastille Day, or Bastille, whatever they call it. But anyway, so either it's the National Assembly, uh, like a month before, uh, or Bastille Day is the start of the, uh, what you call it, French Revolution. All right, now, basically, the king says, oh, boy, this ain't too good, all right? So what the people do is they form a militia, and they call it the, they call it the National Guard, and they, they appoint as, a, uh, as their general a, a nobleman, but he's a famous nobleman who, who fought during the American Revolution. is a Marquis de Lafayette, all right? And so even though he's one of them, uh, meaning the uh, second estate, it's somebody they feel like they can trust. And so it's good because under his leadership, he's going to maintain order at least for a while. All right. Now, here's something else. The great fear. Okay. The great fear takes place just after the Bastille. And that is when uh, the people outside of Paris outside uh, in the countryside, begin hearing rumors. And I guarantee you that these rumors are coming from the, those members of the uh, third estate known as the Borgoises, right? And what they're doing is they're whipping these people up. They're using propaganda because they want this thing to turn violent, all right? And they want them to turn their fear into anger and they wanted to direct it towards those people who make their lives miserable. And that's the aristocrats or the nobles because of all those unfair feudal obligations that they've been made to pay. So what these um, peasants do is they go and they attack all the uh, the manor houses, uh, chateaus, if you will, of the French nobles. And they trying to get after all those records that show that, you know, they have these feudal obligations. And if they happen to find a noble, well, it's not good to be a noble because they then hack them into pieces. Well, what that does is this great fear causes all the nobles to get out of Dodge. And they head uh, across the border, many of them into uh, the Austrian Netherlands, okay, where it's safe. Okay, and they set up shop there, and they're known as the Ama Grays. And what these Ama Grays want is they want they want to bring an army back uh, and and to restore peace. Okay, but the National Assembly for those nobles that, that have not fled, uh, that have joined with the National Assembly, are all too willing to give up all of their rights. Okay, all of their extra privileges, and this, and and so there's this big uh, uh, moment when they kind of relinquish all of their rights. They they no longer want them. Okay, and that's known as the August Decrees. Okay, and so what what that is supposed to mean, at least symbolically, is that the old regime, the old regime, is dead. All right, is dead. And that everybody, that equality that we was talking about has been achieved, okay? And then um, they never got around to writing their uh, constitution because I guess they're too busy killing people. But what they do have time to do is write themselves the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. And that Marquis de Lafayette, he's the author, and he used... Uh, uh, Actually, I think he corresponded with Thomas Jefferson to help him write that document. And it, it, 
highlights some of the uh, types of goals and reforms that they was going for. Okay, so uh, liberty, property, security, those are the, the natural rights that they see fit to put the uh, pen to paper to. Okay, um, and, you know, this idea that if a government is uh, tyrannical, that the people, because of their sovereignty, have a right to overthrow it. And that's the influence of John Locke. All right. So the Declaration of the Rights of Man is a very important document that was written, okay? Um, now, it's important to note that it doesn't say women, all right? And as, as such, women were left out, okay? So uh, the women do feel as if uh, their uh, concerns aren't being listened to, okay? So we'll get into that tomorrow, but that's the Women's March, okay? And we're going to carry this to the end, all right, the Women's March, all right? So uh, you all catch me tomorrow. It's getting late, all right, and this doggone thing long enough as it is. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and shut her down, and then we'll pick up here tomorrow. Good night.